If you've been with us since the beginning of October, we've started a series of messages on money. We began on the first week with a message entitled, Money is the Answer for Everything. And the idea behind this message is money is simply a tool, albeit a very powerful tool. We follow that message with a message entitled, The One Pill to Master Money. The idea behind this message is simply this, stewardship is the key. Today, I want to combine these messages and put them together to deal with our hearts and money. We said last week that money is a powerful tool. We referenced a verse that says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. These verses were found in Matthew 6.24 and Luke 16.33. Jesus repeated them twice to make sure we understand the power of money. No one can serve it. It becomes a master because it is something that can cause us to become enslaved. And you cannot serve both God and money. The picture of mastery and slavery can best be seen in the Bible, in the book of Exodus, particularly with regards to the nation of Egypt. Egypt was a very powerful North African nation that was enslaving people politically, economically, and even spiritually. The master and slave picture is seen in the life of Pharaoh and the slaves. And when you think about money and it being capable of enslaving us, we cannot help but ask money, are you a Pharaoh or a slave? In Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, God is finally ready to deal with Pharaoh and the enslavery that he has caused. It says, on the same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. Notice where it says, I will pass through and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. More importantly, it says, I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. Now, the judgment that came was something that we are all familiar with. It is known as the ten plagues of Egypt. The first plague was the turning of the Nile River into blood. The Nile River was the basis for the economic lifeblood of the entire nation of Egypt. In fact, it was heavily guarded by three gods. The first god, Kum, guarded the river's mouth or the source of the river. The second god, Happy, was the spirit of the Nile. And the third powerful god, Osiris, claimed that the very bloodstream of that runs this God is the Nile itself. It was the economic lifeblood of the nation, and God judged it. Secondly, there was the plague of frogs. The plague of frogs was guarded by uh, the Hecht. Hecht was the goddess of fertility. The Egyptians believed that frogs were a symbol of fertility, and God sent them a flood. They said, you don't control that, I control that, and God judged this goddess Hecht. The third plague was the plague of boils. Egyptians were predisposed to beauty. In fact, they had a beauty, a goddess of beauty known as Hathor. The, 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 the plague was so bad that even the priests could not go, the Bible says, could not go and face Pharaoh because they were covered in boils because God was telling them no amount of beauty, no amount of power, no amount of goddesses is more powerful than I am. And he was judging the gods of Egypt. The gods of Egypt were representative of economics and fertility, of beauty and health and agriculture and even livestock and protection, and even the skies, and even the light. That's why there was a plague of darkness. Each of these are actually representative of something that money can give us today. Money can give us economics, and beauty, and health, and agriculture, and protection, and even allow us to send people to the space, and light. We can have all the light we want if we had all the money in the world. But all of these nine different gods was only subject to one god, Pharaoh, the living god. And all he had was the money. And today, that's why Jesus said, be careful with money. It can become all of these gods and become the one God. And if you were Pharaoh and you had a lot of money, you can literally become the living God. You ever wondered why the Bibles used the word the 10 plagues and why it was 10? Because the number 10 is the number of testing. You'll find that all throughout the Bible. 10 generations from Adam to Noah and God judged the earth. Ten years of Adam, Abraham in Canaan, and Sarah couldn't wait and gave him a concubine. Ten brothers who sold Joseph into slavery was a test on relationship. Ten, the ten plagues of Egypt was really a test of Pharaoh's heart. The Ten Commandments was a test for the Israelites 
in the promised land where they were going to be obedient or not. The 10 days of Daniel was a standards test. Would you keep the standards despite living in a foreign land? The 10 virgins was a test on preparedness. The 10 lepers was a test on gratefulness. And finally, the 10 days of revelation was a test on suffering. But the greatest test that comes to us is the tithe, a.k.a. the money test. That's why the number 10 is why the Pharaoh was judged and tested. Money is ultimately a test. And that's why God uses that to reveal the truth of who we are. Why does God test us? For the same reason that we test ourselves if we have COVID. We want to see the state of our health. We want to see if there's something there that can hurt us, something that is foreign or destructive, or something that is impure. That's why God tests us, to test our purity. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, verse 3, the crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. You can test money and silver and gold using equipment and tools, but God tests our heart in the same way that we test silver and gold. Why? To check for impurity. Impurity will reduce one's value. Money, if we're impure about how we deal with money, will cause us to be selfish and will ultimately destroy us, destroy our marriages, destroy our families. Impurity can be dangerous. It can be a source of pride. And power that comes with pride is absolutely dangerous. Impurity means reduced potency. Your potential is reduced when something is impure, a, a vitamin, a mineral, a, a, a medicine. That's why we want to test it. Jeremiah 17 verse 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. God searches and tests and examines our hearts and minds to reward us. That's the reason why God tests us to test our purity. Secondly, to test our preparedness. Imagine being a father of a young child and you want to make sure that they're tested before you entrust to them a car. A car is a powerful thing and money is a hundred times more powerful than a car. God wants to test our preparedness. God wants to make sure our hearts are ready so that this thing will not kill us or destroy us or destroy others with us. And thirdly, because he loves us. God loves us so much, that's why he tests us. Think about the number of tests we give our children. We want to test them because we only want the best. We want to make sure their values are not reduced. We want to make sure that their potential is not reduced. And more importantly, we want to make sure that they are not in any sort of danger. Money is a dangerous thing when we're not tested. It's a powerful tool, yes, and we may have a stewardship, but if our hearts are in the wrong place, money will destroy us. Now, the second part of my message is, how does God test us? There's three different tests that I can show you that are critical to your understanding of how God tests us with money. The first test is known as the firstborn test. And we saw that in Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. He says, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of people and animals. And you think about how Pharaoh traded the firstborn of an entire nation, including his own firstborn, for money. And how many times people do that because they fail the firstborn test? In Genesis chapter 4 verse, 3, 4, 4, verse 3, this is the first time we see this idea of the firstborn. It says, in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Notice, Cain brought some fruits of the soil as an offering to God. This is about offering things to God. Now, we all know that all the plants and all the soil and all the animals come from God in the first place, but God was demanding an offering to acknowledge who he is and that our hearts are right with him. And Cain just brought some. In verse 4, Abel also brought an offering. Fat portions this time. He just didn't bring some kind of soil plants. He brought the fat portions of some of the firstborn of his flock. And what's important here is not just the fat portions, but the fact that he brought the fat portions, and the firstborn of the flock. The firstborn is an important concept. What that simply means is there is a possibility there will not be a secondborn or a thirdborn, in which case when you give the firstborn, you're giving it in faith because you believe that God will come through again and again and again. As a result of that, the Lord looked with favor on Abel's offering. This is the firstborn test. When we do it in faith, we don't just give an offering to God because we give an offering to God, we give it in faith. How does God test us? The second test is the first conviction test. 
interesting story about a man named Jacob who managed to steal the, the birthright of his brother. And now he was on the run. Whilst he was running away and trying to uh, well, find refuge with his uncle Laban, he ended up falling asleep midstream, midpoint. And he, in the dream, he encounters God in a stairway to heaven. God speaks to him and tells him, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to watch over you. I'm going to protect you. I'll take care of you. And watch what happens in chapter 28, verse 20 of Genesis. Jacob made a vow. He made a vow saying, if God will be with me and watch over me after the dream, and he hears all of this, and he's now saying, God, if you'll do this, and I'm taking, and, uh, and, and, and you'll watch over me in this journey, I'm taking, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. How long before there was a legal tenth in the law of the Jews, this was a conviction that came out of this man's heart. Let me warn you about the tithe. Pass the firstborn test, do it in faith. But if you don't have a conviction to do it, you might as well not do it because there's no point in doing it. The reason why the tithe is powerful and the reason why it works is because it proves that this is your conviction. It proves that you have a heart that's pure, that desires to see the greatness of your God and that you've been prepared by God and that because he loves you. The third test is the first tenth test. This time we see this in the life of Abraham. In Genesis 14 verse 8, there were this king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zobim, the king of Bela, marched out and drew battle lines in the valley of Siddim. A war was about to break out. And they were fighting these four kings, or five kings rather, were fighting against these four other kings, against Kedar Lamer, Kedal, the king of Goyim, Afarmel, king of Shinar, Ariok, and Elisar. Four kings against five. Notice the interesting thing about the story. There are nine kings that are about to have this huge battle. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food and then went away. Notice that the four kings attacked the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. In that process, they ended up carrying Abraham's nephew Lot and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. That's why Abraham heard about the war. And Abraham heard that his relative had been taken captive. He called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. I can imagine Abraham looking like Braveheart. And he kills all of these guys and routs everybody. And literally, with these 314 men, routes nine kings. Great job, great name, people and possessions. In Genesis chapter 12, Abraham was promised by God, you will be a great nation. You're going to be powerful. You're going to be rich and famous. And here was the test that Abraham was going to be encounter because he could very well be the 10th king. In Genesis 14, 17, after Abraham returned from de defeating Kedar Lamer and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. Notice he has defeated the five kings who defeated the four kings. And if this was a basketball game, now he's the champion. He's now the guy that beat all nine kings. And he's met in the king's valley. And at the back of his head, he must probably be thinking, is this the moment where I'm going to become great? The king of Sodom basically tells him, give me the people, but you keep the goods. Basically, this is the, this is the tithe. This is the, you're the king. You're now the new pharaoh. You're now the new ruler. The nine kings are now acknowledging him as the tenth king. Abraham, if you read the story, refuses. Instead, he encounters Melchizedek, the king of Salem, who brought him bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. Notice where the priest actually blesses him and says, Praise be to God Most High who delivered you into your enemies into your hand. The priest blesses him and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. It was more than just a conviction. It was the first tenth of everything he had. Passing the test of money is an important part of being master over our money. If you've ever wondered why we start our services with the moment to ask for tithes and offerings, it's simply this. We want you to pass the test. And if that's not your conviction, that's up to you. If you're being manipulated to do it or you're being forced to do it, don't do it. There's no point in doing it because the only reason to do it is to pass 
God's test to show that your heart has been purified, that you're prepared to handle more, that you understand how much he loves you and that you're doing it in faith and it's a deep conviction that you hold and that you're willing to give him the first tenth of your money. Not the second, not the third, not the fourth, not a tip, the first tenth because you believe that he's testing you. And finally, to make us experience the best. Why does God test us? How does he test us? He does all of this to make us experience the best. There is no way to talk about the tithe without referencing Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that they may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. Notice what it says. Test me in this. It's interesting that God tests us, but at the same time, he is a one-of-a-kind God who says, you can test me in this yourself. God is an amazing God. He's a unique God. He's one of a kind. He tests us, but at the same time, he says, test me in this. Imagine that you were given a pizza by somebody. Pizza, 10 slices. And the person that gave it to you says, to acknowledge that I'm the one who gave this to you, give me one piece. If we're having a hard time giving that, it's probably because we really don't believe that the pizza is his. If you really believe that someone owns the pizza and he gave it just to you, and you're not the Pharaoh who made the pizza, then you shouldn't have a problem giving him one piece. If you don't believe that, then you will have a problem giving him that one piece. The truth of the matter is, you, a lot of us don't really believe that the pizza is his and he just gave it to us. That's Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the guy who has all the chariots and he thinks he's done with chariots and he needs more chariots and he needs more armies, more slaves, more maids, more houses, more everything because he doesn't get it. And he's failing the test. And at some point, God had to judge him. It's a question for you. Are you a Pharaoh? Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 continues. Test me in this, says the Lord God Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much a blessing that there will be no room for you, enough for you to store it. Amazing. He says, test me and let me prove to you that I will throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there might not be room enough for you to store it. Are you a Pharaoh who just stores for yourself? And are you a slave who doesn't really believe that God can provide, that God can shower you with a blessing? This idea of money and the test of money is very important for us to understand, to make us experience God's best. Why? He's a -a one-of-a-kind God. He's the one who wants to bless us and shower us with the best. And finally, he's the one with the real firstborn. Notice in Colossians chapter 1 verse 13, it says, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. There it is. He rescued us from the dominion of darkness, from slavery and brought us into the kingdom in the son he loves. And what did he do? He says, the son is the image of the invisible God, the real firstborn over all creation. And he is the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn among the dead. God gave us his very own firstborn so that our firstborn, secondborn, thirdborn, and we ourselves will be saved from the plague and the enslavery of money. Let me summarize. Why does God test us? To test our purity. To test our preparedness. Because he loves us. How does he test us? To see our faith. Will we give him the firstborn when we don't even know where the next one's going to come? The first conviction. Are we going to be like Jacob who says, I'll make a vow. Because, not because I have to. I don't have to argue whether it's the Old Testament, New Testament. What? It's irrelevant. My conviction is, I love you, and I want to pass the test. And thirdly, I'm going to give you the first, of my te- the first tenth of whatever I have. Why? You're one of a kind God. Why? Because you want to bless me. Why? Because you actually gave me the best, the very firstborn of all creation, and the very firstborn from among the dead. Lord Jesus, thank you for saving us and rebe- redeeming us from our state of slavery to sin, and from the darkness, the kingdom of darkness. Thank you for being the firstborn in all creation and willingly became the firstborn from among the dead. Give us a heart of worship, Lord. Show us that 
The giving of our tithes and offerings is an act of worship that acknowledges your worth. May we be proven a people whose master is you and not money. A people who do not serve money but you, our God. Bless our tithes and our offerings as we worship you with our money. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen.